this? It is. If, if that's correct, and I believe that is the correct view. So if Peter is directing Mark to write the Gospel of Mark, why wouldn't he mention that up on me <laughs> that the church will be built? Oh, what a start for, uh, for the lecture that just kicked off. All right, so much for Vatican friends. All right. Um, you need to Matthew. Matthew is that his gospel is the only one that calls the church by name. Saw that overview. Overview, a sophomoric basic overview, chapters 1 through 3. The person of the king, including his ancestry, right? For 17 verses in chapter 1. We are right here, Craig. Uh, the Advent through Mary, chapters, uh, chapter 1, 18, verse 18 through chapter 2, verse 23. You have John as the ambassador, chapter 3. Next, we have the preparation of the king. This is a great book if you, if you like topical studies. You know, we're going to talk about the person of the king for the next month. And then we're going to talk about the preparation of the king for the next three weeks. You know, something very... Very good for the body, I think, if you're a pastor. Included in baptism and temptation in 3 and 4. A lot of stuff happening in the first four chapters in Matthew. Next, he moves on to the proclamation of the king. Right? So far, you have the person of the king in Matthew, preparation of the king, and then the proclamation of the king. And that's funny, right? Because it's right after he's been baptized. Interesting. He's baptized. Boom! He goes straight into temptation. And then, now, we have the proclamation of the king. So you have his message in chapter 4, his manifesto in 5, 6, and 7, and his methods in 8 and 9. <clears throat> I know that's a lot in just one sentence. That's the very bottom paragraph. So proclamation of the king, <clears throat> his message, manifesto, and methods in chapter 8 and 9. <clears throat> Let me blow this up for you a little better. Is that better? Okay. Okay. So, person of the king, preparation of the king, proclamation of the king. No idea what's going on there. Uh, I believe it's a bottom paragraph. So, one theory supposed that the three Gospels independently drew on a now lost Aramaic Gospel, right? You've heard of Q, Q, Quelle, in German, Q, source. source. Before we get into the arguments for and against that, here's what I'm going to say, because we don't have Q. But if there were a Q, that would predate Mark, would it not? If Mark was the first one written, and he drew from Q, that means the New Testament is it's earlier than even Mark. That's pretty significant. So, if they all drew on it, well, that, that just helps our case. Because if we assume that Q is real, okay, Mark wrote at such and such time, okay, well, then we had New Testament ideology phrases in addition to inscriptions on tombs and early hymns, etc., uh, way before even Mark. So that, that is just one of those arguments. Hey, for the sake of, uh, of the argument, let's just go ahead and roll with that. And uh, now we have something that is hardcore that predates Mark and the others. So one theory is supposed that the three Gospels independently drew on a now lost Aramaic Gospel, either oral or written. Another alternative states that Matthew, this could get, get a little confusing here, that Matthew was written first, and Mark attempted to fuse Matthew and Luke. These theories are not widely held today by our biblical scholars today and most theologians. The more common theory today claims that Mark was not the last but the earliest gospel. Now, when we quote or refer to early church fathers in, in, in systematic theology, historical theology, or church history, you know, we almost run to the church fathers like as if they were creeds, right? They're re really important. Well, you've got to remember here that a lot of these guys disagree with modern scholarship today. And that is, now, now you have to think, 
where we're at in hermeneutics, because hermeneutics, you're dealing with historical criticism and textual criticism, because we have now been, well, we haven't in this room, but collectively, the church has been doing this for 2,000 years. So there's a lot more data available, you know, and with computers and lining up gospels and words and everything else that we have, you know, there is, there is, I'm not going to say there's nothing new under the sun, but you might find a nugget or two in your life by employing all these sources. So that's kind of what's going on. <clears throat> so the most common theory today claims that Mark was not the last, but the earliest gospel composed independently of another early but lost source. There's Quelly or Q. Both Mark and this hypothesized lost source supposedly provided the basis for Matthew and Luke, who worked independently of each other. Uh, this view eventually came to be called the two-source hypothesis. The hypothetical lost source was labeled Q for Quelly from the German word source. A variation of this view argues that Mark was, in fact, the first gospel, but there were but that there was no cue, uh, or there was a cue that he drew from. There either was or wasn't, right? Many believe that he didn't, and a lot of the guys that we don't like in the realm of philosophy and theology, including the Jesus Seminar and John Dominic Crossan, you know, all these guys that are running with the lost gospels and, right, the lost gospels as if the gospel of Judas was just discovered today, right? It's been around for a long, long time. There is no lost gospel, right? Lost gospels. Now you want to talk about Q, same thing there, but the, but the, 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 the liberal scholarship, typically, they run with the Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary Madden, Gospel of Thomas, and they are, of course, high horse as well on Q. So they're really involved in this stuff. So either Mark borrowed from Q or he didn't. And if he did borrow from Q, it works in our favor still, as far as the, the early dating of the New Testament. Okay. Let's see here. That's broken down. I have no idea what's going on here. Do you see this? This is from Geisler. Uh, I pulled this from a popular survey of the New Testament. That is one of your textbooks. I'm not going to read every number that's here. But Geisler asks here, he says, Why do the first three Gospels view the ministry of Christ from the same general perspective? To be more uh, specific, why are they so similar in content? And why are, they, why are there, there marked differences between them? If they're all barred from each other. Those are just good questions to ask. A whole host of subsidiary questions are involved here. Who wrote first? Who is depending on whom? What sources did each writer have, etc.? Popular survey, page 40. So as for the basic data in the four Gospels, scholars have calculated peculiarities with consequences. And you can see, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 42% in Matthew, peculiarities, coincidences, 58. Versus Mark at 7, coincidences, 93. Luke at 59%, 41 in the coincidences. And then you have John, 92, and 8. Okay, this looks very, very boring to most people. But how this is deduced, right? Is, is there's a lot of work going into these things. So I say we, uh, for the people who actually sit down and do this, we have to cut them some slack and show some respect because they're very excited about the, these fields of study. And uh, you, you never know when that one's going to benefit you, how it all ties together with everything else. All right, now the synoptic problem. Only 50 to 55 verses, according to Geisler, are unique to Mark. Only 50 to 55. I'd say that's still quite a bit, because if they're drawing from one another, where, you know, where do those come from? And that's Mark, which is the sharpest, go, uh, shortest gospel. Matthew has 1,068 verses. 50, I mean, 500 of those are common with Mark. Luke has 1,149 verses. 320 are common with Mark. And Mark, being the shortest gospel, has 661 verses. Again, 50 to 55 are not common with Matthew or Luke. And Matthew and Luke has 250 verses in common that are not in Mark. Luke has 580 verses peculiar to itself. <laughs> 
again with a Gentile tone, because Luke was a, a, a Gentile doctor, traveling companion with Paul. Matthew has three hundred verses peculiar to itself, which has a very Jewish th tone. So the big question is, why are there such differences if they borrowed from Q? If they did, why are they there are these differences? So, based on this, you could say, well, they probably didn't borrow from that document. <clears throat> So the similarities would be where they're borrowing from Q, right? As opposed to their own peculiarities. All right. So one must wonder why we don't have the original source of Q, right? We simply have zero manuscripts of Q and lack any historical record, quotes of its existence. You would think. But then again, we have to be careful. I'm just going to be fair. What if we did find Q tomorrow? Well, it doesn't change the course of Christianity, does it? There can be many cues. I mean, we have New Testament fragments are appearing ever so often, right? The old apologetics, systematic theology books have 5,500 Greek New Manuscripts. Well, we're up to 5,700 plus now. Before you know it, it will be 6,000 plus the Coptic and the rest of them, right? Totaling some 25,000. That'll be 30 probably by the time we're all in our 90s. So, notice how I included you guys. Be, be my age, you know, so we're all in our 90s. <laughs> Thanks, Ed <laughs> You're funny. All right, so if they borrow from Q, um, if only Mark borrowed from Q, then why is there still such differences in Matthew and Luke, especially if they drew on Mark? So having said that, um, this I already shared at the first day of class, I believe. Uh, let me, if I didn't, Mark's account depicts Jesus as a servant of the Lord. Sounds familiar? Servant, uh, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 who suffers and dies for his people. Luke portrays um, Jesus as the compassionate, the perfect man. He's concerned for the poor and sick and, and for women and the downtrodden. John is a unique gospel in itself, being 98, different being written in 96 or 98 A.D., um, Different from the other three, known as the synoptics. Again, see together, synoptic, see together. Um, John presents Jesus as the eternal Son of God, one nature with the Father who came into existence uh, to redeem mankind. Uh, Corey and Karen, did you guys get John 1 down? Have you guys spent time on it? A little bit? Yeah, the Greek one that we wrote down. No? All right. En arche en alagas. Okay. Alagas en pros tan theon, theon, theos, right? Kai okay. theos en alagas. And God was that word, or in God was, in, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, and God was the word. As opposed to, and the word was God. And God was the word. You know, sit there and cross back and forth and exit and do funny arrows, and uh, way more powerful in Greek. And Swedish. No, I'm just joking. Okay, so um, propagation of the king. Propagation of the king. That's next in, in Matthew. Chapter 10, including his messengers. Uh, the mission, also chapter 10. Not the Great Commission, that's in 28, chapter 28, right? Go ye therefore to all nations. And notice that in the Great Commission, you're actually supposed to have a little bit of, little bit of uh, knowledge, right? A, little, a lot of it, a little bit. Yeah, it's, that's not to say that, you know, you get saved yesterday at the church and then you go and get baptized next week. That doesn't mean God can't use you as a witness. Of course it does, you know. And uh, you can go over and paint bomb shelters in Israel if you have the means to figure that out. But, um, but part of the 12 going out that have already been with him for three years, he's telling them, and it's a good thing to remember, for teachers and missionaries alike and worship leaders and assistant pastors and youth pastors all the way down the aisle. Go ye therefore and teach, right? Teach, baptize, teach everything that I commanded. You know? He went to all nations. Yeah. Did you see the Bible AD with uh, Jesus' ascension? He didn't breathe on the apostles, the Holy Spirit. They didn't show up in the You know the new AD series? On TV. No, I saw the preview of that. Yeah, it's supposed to be really good. It was, is it? Well, it's, it's done in a, in a very high quality way, but they're leaving out a lot of hmm. important stuff. Important stuff. Changing important stuff. So it's, it's pretty close, but it's, there's still 
why are you changing this yeah. specific thing? Key moment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the answer is, I'm, you just sit back and relax and be glad that we actually have a Bible, right? <laughs> what they're doing something. I saw Exodus. I loved Exodus, but that's not accurate, you know? I mean, it's better than Noah, but, you know. Yeah, I know. It's frustrating, but I haven't seen it. So, he didn't breathe on them, huh? Are you being too critical where you can't enjoy the movie? No, I can. I can <laughs> the I've enjoyed. I thought they did a really good job, but no. Yeah. It's, it's I think he took me in a completely Yeah? No, no. It's just, why? Historical criticist. You intentionally changed it. Why yeah. Why would you, it's so easily read here, just go by this story. It's great. Why do you intentionally change it? Yeah, I know. You have to wonder. Doctrines of demons. <laughs> that wasn't extreme, was it? <laughs> No, it is frustrating. I try to relax and actually enjoy them for what I can, but if it's some, if I'm watching it with my son, I'm like, hey, does that sound right? He's like, no, Dad. No, it's like crazy. I go, no, I wasn't like that, was he? No. So it's a good uh, checker. All right, including his messengers, the mission, chapter 10, and also the message in chapter 11. The Messiahship of Jesus. I love this. The Messiahship of Jesus is laid out between chapters 21 and 25. And his messiahship includes the apocalyptic chapter of 24 and 25, right? Can you imagine, <laughs> you've been to Israel, just standing there and Jesus actually declaring Matthew 24 right in front of you? You know? If we all end up over there again, that's something we should do. We should go into the Kidron Valley at midnight when the fog is coming in and you see the Islamic minarets, whatever you call those yellow things, looks like glow sticks sticking up and it's just creepy and then we can say Hades used to be here and then we'll read Matthew 24 and I'll run home on the Jerusalem walls but uh, interesting setting interesting setting well they burned trash outside the, uh, the Ezekiel's wall oh. yeah um, south Kidron Valley and when I say south it's not that big you know we walk across the Kidron Valley in about three and a half minutes. You know. I share that with my wife. It says, you know, when it says Jesus went from the Mount of Olives across Kidron Valley and into Jerusalem, I said, that took probably six minutes. She goes, you're so stupid. <laughs> because she thinks it took like months, right? <laughs> you know. I'm like, I'm serious. She goes, I know. It just sounds stupid. Do we have to say it like that? You know. But uh, yeah, I guess I am at times. Right? A lot of donkeys and... Yeah, probably barrels going on. Yeah. All right. And you need a snack. Mm-hmm. Well, it probably took longer if it didn't go through Ezekiel's Gate. If it went around the Southern Gate, it would have taken a little longer. There were people coming in and out of that place. All right. Who is your premier, by the way? Uh, well, uh, the the marketing guru, Karen, um, she had <laughs> she had an idea about showing you know having a, having a movie night, right, where we could watch the, resur the resurrection thing. I think we should. Uh, Craig, I watched it, I watched it, I had him print 25 copies, only 25 copies, but there's a couple of things on, on the video that I don't like. They've been playing with the light because Dr. Joe Holden from Veritas, the sun was, there was a, like, he's in the shade, half of his face is in the shade and half of it's in the sun, it's horrible natural lighting. And you see a golf cart driving by Marietta, boom, buzzing by. And so as his face is getting really, really dark, kind of like half creepy, yeah. Ted just goes, let's just dump it. I'm like, no, we have to have Joe in here, you know. Just, he's yeah. my friend. He kind of like, you know, Veritas pitched in a little bit for this movie so we could pull it all off. And so I go, you have to play with the color. Well, when I'm watching it on my 70-inch, it's like totally white, like, like painted, Photoshop white. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. The outside's all dark. <laughs> Lazarus come forth. So, you know, little details like that. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna school him and say, hey, fix that right now. Like we're in a hurry. A couple of other things that we we learned from our mistakes on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Way too many pictures moving. You know, trying to be all cool with it. Pictures. You know what I mean? Like talk about a rabbi and you see a rabbi floating and then it looks pixelated and all that stuff. So on the resurrection thing, I told him, I just want to be like this. Just from shoot to shoot to shoot, make it moving, you know what I mean? 
Neil Geisler. I'm in a boat on the Sea of Galilee driving, talking about Spinoza and Dave Hume. Just, you know, fun stuff, and we just cut it out. But there's one picture that I want from Rome, and that's Paul's prison, when I'm talking about the martyrs. And just so you see Paul's prison in Rome, you know. Little things like that. But uh, maybe we should. This summer, I don't know. We'll make an announcement. We can do it in here. That's what you were trying to get the, the room for? Yeah, but you guys had the thing going and on. Yeah, and I'm I'm back and forth all over the place, so I wouldn't. That's why I didn't respond. I didn't want you to think about it because we can't. And if we did, we have to squeeze it in on just a late notice. Yeah. And uh, so, well, remind me, Karen, and let's try to do that. Have a potluck. Yeah. You bring some vegan food. I'll bring a pot. I'll bring the veggie dogs. I'll bring a There you go. <laughs> Danny, what are you bringing? The, wit, the Corvette? Take us all spinning. <laughs> so, sure. Messiahship, you got that right, 21 through 25. Then towards the end we see the passion of the king. Notice there's a lot of peas here. The passion of the king, which includes the Passover, of course, rejecting the lamb and sacrifice the Passover lamb. Was it legal to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane at the hour they did so? It's totally illegal, right? Why? You couldn't arrest anybody at midnight? If they got a DUI on a donkey, you couldn't throw them in jail? Saturday night? Monday night? Is that the only reason? No. Because you want the Jewish to There you go. Yeah, yeah. And once they arrested him, they legally took him to whose home? Right. Can't be having a trial going on there. I go to Sanhedrin. So. That was the part of night. That was the issue, right? Right. The Sanhedrin could not meet at night. Yeah, they closed down. Yeah. Well, they, didn't, they originally didn't want to arrest him at Passover. Remember? Because they said unless there's an uproar of the people. Yeah. And there's an interesting thing I read. I don't know what book it was. Maybe it was one of the herme hermeneutic books that we're not using in here. It was something about, um, <clears throat> I just read it real quick, something where, where Caiaphas says something, but we don't believe Caiaphas is a prophet, right? But he says something that is prophetic to, to, to the likings. And I, like, I just read through this. I, it didn't, I don't remember if that had a chapter and verse or just paraphrased it, but it was something to the tone of, um, that's just going to sound horrible. It's, for, it's better for one man die than for the whole nation of Israel to perish. Right. And boy, could you add some <clears throat> prophetic, you know, zest to that statement alone, you know. Yeah. Well, it's really naughty to do that. <laughs> no, go. It's not in my head, so it's on my phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was no legal basis for Jesus' arrest because no one had presented a formal charge of any crime since he was taken. Moreover, those who went with Judas to have Jesus arrested included the priests and elders, his judges, among whom were the ones who bribed Judas. That's me. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jewish law permitted only daylight proceedings. Number three, the indictment against Jesus was illegal because the judges themselves brought up the charge without any prior testimony. That's a good one, huh? Yeah. Number four, the court illegally proceeded to hold its trial of Jesus before sunrise, so no one would be able to, no one would be available to testify on his behalf. Um, it's like the mafia, the Danny. There's like such a list here. Holy cow! Yeah. On and on and on. They didn't play. Yeah. Totally. Totally horrific. So, Passion of the King is uh, quite heavy, <clears throat> what they did to him. Now, put yourself, put yourself into Caiaphas' shoes for a minute, right? 
hermeneutics, right? When you're reading Caiaphas, as opposed to that guy stinks, can stand this guy, you know? Looking at these hard hitters, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducean theologians, you know what I mean? And just they love their tradition, you know. I have no problem with tradition. I think you lose tradition too much you in the left field. Um, I hold on to something. I mean, old is gold. Hold on to what's good. But these fellas, you know, they have this guy running around. And remember, there were more, more than Jesus in the time of the Maccabees in the first century running around with the Messiah complex. There's nothing new. People claiming to be the Messiah. Who was that? Who who was the self-proclaimed Messiah after Jesus? Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba. Or the Jews actually thought he was the Messiah, right? And then they found out the hard way. He would have been he would have been the perfect messianic candidate for the zealots who'd run around stab, you know, Romans, you know, just riots and revolts and everything else. So anyway, so let's just call you Caiaphas and you Caiaphas's brother and secretary and you got, you know, Gamaliel over there and everything else, and you hear about these knuckleheads running around claiming to be the one for their five minutes of fame. And then Jesus comes along. In, a, in, in that context now, as you read the scriptures, you can go, wow, well, how much time did Caiaphas actually spend with Jesus? We know Nicodemus spent more time with Jesus than Caiaphas did, right? Just actually, well, I'm presupposing they actually became a follower of Christ. But it was very, very worried at first, right? Just like Paul. You're going to lose all your friends. Like worse than becoming a Messianic Jew today. I mean, today they have you buried. Bye. You became a follower of Yeshua. So they, they didn't play back then, that's for sure. So having said that, can you blame perhaps the Pharisees? How many times did Jesus go to Jerusalem? At least three. That's not many. Yeah. I'm going to say three, for sure, less than five. So if it's less, I'm just going to say probably three, for sure, less than four. <laughs> but uh, so it's not like it's not like Caiaphas was hanging hanging around up in northern Galilee, right? Or you know Masada and Jezreel Valley, following Jesus, seeing these did, things. Yeah. Some of them did. Do you think Caiaphas would get off of his his uh, comfortable Sanhedrin seat just to hang out? Yeah. And then he gets the report, and maybe it's distorted, maybe it's not. All this stuff. So we got another Galilean running around. Where's he from? Nazareth. Wow. That's like the Jewish Corinth. Oh, you Corinthian. That was a bad one. You've heard about that, right? Right. During those days? If they call you Corinthian, you're like, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and Hollywood and Rio de Janeiro on steroids. You know, just like a Corinthian. Has anything come out of Nazareth? That's sort of like the Corinthian. Nazareth? No doubt you go there today. It's like, really? Places and all that today, right? Extremely dirty. Until you get to the Church of Annunciation and you get in there and you shut the gate and you're like, yes! You know? But, um... So, permanently, can you, can you blame them? Here's another guy. Well, he claims to do this. What? Before Abraham was, I am. Oh, okay. So he's, he dates way back. Okay. What else? He says he's going to destroy the temple. Build it right back up. That's what he said. Our temple? King David? You know, Solomon? That temple? Yeah. The one that King Herod is rebuilding right now? Yeah, he's going to destroy it. But that's the heart of a whole, whole religion right there. He's going to destroy it and, and single-handedly build it up in three days. Let me see this guy, right? And then Judas betrays him and all this stuff. Read that into it. You might cut Caiaphas a little bit of slack, not justifying what he's doing, but get yourself into the mindset that led up to the arrest and everything else, you know. All right. Uh, Lastly, we got the power of the king, where we see the resurrection of the king of glory. Uh, then the king's requirements of his followers. King's requirements in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore. Um, all right. What are some of the key features 
in Matthew. The birth of Jesus announced to Joseph. Uh, chapter 1, 18 through 20. The mentioning of the Magi's, chapter 2, first 12 verses. Jesus and his parents' flight to Egypt. So, Mary was visited by what angel in Nazareth? Michael, Gabriel? Gabriel. Gabriel, all right? So she's now pregnant with child there. And then what was going on in Egypt? Why did they have to go to, to Egypt for the what? The census, right? What's that? What does that involve? Egypt. Why did they have to go to Egypt? Bethlehem? Bethlehem, Egypt, back to Nazareth. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. So, what were they doing in, uh, who called, okay, it was, it was Herod, right? Told him to go to Bethlehem. Yeah. To do what exactly? What did that involve? Right, yeah, to get a head count of Jews and everything else that's going on, right? And so, a lot of people miss that. They think, you know, Nazareth and then uh, Bethlehem and back to Nazareth. No, they went even as far as down to Egypt, you know, and then back to Nazareth. And then after he was rejected there at an older age, remember, he revealed himself. I, we're not sure of what, what synagogue he was preaching at. Uh, it wasn't the one in Capernaum where it says, you know, today this has been fulfilled in your ears. That's not in Capernaum. I believe he might have taught there for sure. I mean, literally a stone's throw from Peter's house. Why would he not? You know, the lower uh, basaltic stone level. So, in any event, um, now, here's something to think about, too, when, <clears throat> when you're reading uh, the birth of Jesus announced to Joseph, right? First Mary, he shows up to Joseph because there's all this turmoil going on. Hey, I'm with child, really? You know, should I, should I just let this girl go? What should I do? And, and he could have treated her really bad if he wanted to, but Joseph was a good guy, which is probably why God chose him, etc. Now, was Mary at peace when Gabriel showed up, showed up? I'm going somewhere with this. Was she like, hi, angel, sit down? She was troubled, right? When Gabriel got the attention of Joseph, right, was he at peace or was he troubled? He was troubled. Right. He was troubled up until that point. Right, right. Now, I'm making a comparison here. When you look at Muhammad the founder of Islam, he was terrified over and over and over and over and over and over again when he heard his little sermons or messages who write this down, were, you know, were they demons, were they angelic, is this God, he was never at rest, being choked in his bed, write these things down, you know what I mean? And so, just think about that, you know, if he was one of the good guys, one of the good prophets, and it says, who showed up? Because God did not act that way at all throughout the Old Testament. And now in the New Testament, sure, there were fearful moments. But it was, hey, 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 slow down. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. It was immediately, you know, the presence of an angel. So big differences there. And think about that when you're reading cults. And they say that an encounter with an angel of light and all this stuff, right? Now, you might be at peace. If you're into the occult or, the, or just cults alone... You're in your own little special circle and everything feels groovy and everything else. That Paul condemns that too. He says, even if we are an angel, right, come down and says, hey. Yeah, exactly. So we've got to be careful with that stuff too. But uh, anyway, just thinking about Muhammad, Mary, and Joseph in its context. Of course, he's 600 years later, right? Um, so, which one? Up there in a... Uh, yeah. yeah. You see Louis? Oh. Yeah, because everyone said, oh, you got to go, you got to go. And I had a night off, and I went, oh, let's go. And he goes, holy cow. Did you sit 20 feet away like, I don't know, with this guy? Yes, <laughs> Peter. Uh -huh. I was there with him one time, too. Yeah. <laughs> then he hands me the microphone. I'm like, oh, dear, where are you going to start here? I was there. Yeah, you were. That was a crazy night. Well, they enjoy it. Come 
like, like going through it. Now. Yeah, people oh. come with like papers that they're reading and mm -hmm. arguments that they prepared. And have you been with him? Yeah, Lewis is really got a mission. You might not agree with the the style and everything, but you get a kick out of it for sure. I would think I'd agree with the style. You might agree with the style. That might be right up your alley. <laughs> right? Corey's <Right? laughs> like, bring it! Right? Yeah. I didn't see a dead person. Yeah, I, mean, I, I didn't, there was one? Oh, that's probably when I walked by. Oh, this is the place when I kept on walking and then we came back? I'm just joking. <laughs> Uh, oh. Like me, the meaning of what, what is it after the death? Right. After life, then. Is it a wake up a little bit? No, I think it's, you know, I think it's the, that you're totally depraved. You know, it's the whole idea that you're a dead man. Uh, it's just an attention getter. It's just yeah. a I know. Yeah, I know. Well, he knows how to do it when he pulls out the poster on Islam. Yeah. Muhammad was, Muhammad was, Muhammad was, Muhammad was. You're just like, oh my goodness. Pedophile. Pedophile. Man. Race. No That's the place to go if you're a suicide bomber, right? Just go, you know what, dude? I'm going to send you home early. <laughs> it's just he must have a divine protector. He must. Because He's I can tell you, they, he, he gets people to go and tell them. Yes, Lewis, we're talking about you, Lewis. <laughs> Lewis is like a, like a TikTok Jonah when he's up there, huh? A little bit. Right? Say, I'm not going there. No, I'm just joking. Oh. Yeah, that, that's... Uh, but hey, he's making a dent. That wasn't trying to be confrontational. No, you were trying to be. Uh, I was trying to be light. You're trying to listen. You're trying to listen. <laughs> yeah. I was, and I was trying to have a rational discourse, like a normal conversation, and just hey, slow down. <laughs> that's not. That's not right. Let's go this route, you know. And the thing I was getting at, man, there was a grenade coming. I was like, all right, we're done now. Take over. Remember the guy who goes, I like you, I hate you. Yeah. Remember that guy? He likes you. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, well, good. At least, you know, maybe he, I made him think. Lord, take over. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. That was a wild night. And then and then we got a flat tire in Stance Benz. Oh. What? Right? Oh, yeah. Downtown L.A., rugged street, all these, you know, lowriders cruising by and Going to McDonald's, 1.30 in the morning, one guy watching the car. What a scene, man. <clears throat> we'll ever go to that again. We're taking your vet on my excursion. That's it. Yeah. All right. Jesus' key instructions on the Mount of Beatitudes, right? Sermon on the Mount. Do you know why they, why they believe that's the area? Huh? You haven't been there yet. And you know what's funny, Corey? You know, you have to go. There. You can't have a Master's of Biblical Studies by going to Israel. I'm going to make that the last, like, three units requirements. That'll get them over. What do you think? No, Sermon on the Mount. Why they picked that spot is because of the, the acoustics. Because of the acoustics, you know? That's, like, the only place, so they say, that if you sit at the Mount of Beatitudes, where there's a church, out there's a fence now. You just kind of look over. And we must have been sitting somewhere here. If you can jump that fence, that's the one fence I haven't jumped, and you probably shouldn't. <clears throat> but... Apparently, if you sit there and just go, hello, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people could hear you. The acoustic is supposed to work there. That's one of the reasons why they believe that's a spot. So it's, it's really refreshing. First time I went there, um, I read the Sermon on the Mount, just in my own corner, you know, just right there in the spot, hoping that that was it. So uh, then you have his, uh, his teachings on the law in chapter 5, 17 through 20 on murder. Right? Clarifying some things. Hey, kill in your heart. You're guilty too. Right? Uh, hating your brother. Same thing there. And then you have oaths. On oaths. Uh, chapter 5, 33 through, through uh, 37. And on non-resistance. What could that mean? Right to bear arms? Justify war? Unjustified war? Well, you have to put Jesus into context here too. First time he came. Right? as a peaceful, suffering servant, riding lowly on a donkey, right, into Jerusalem. Second time he's coming in full-blown vengeance, sword out of his mouth, not literally, symbolically, a sword out of his mouth, and he's upset at what the world has done to him in his rejection, 
It's done to his people, to his church. Yeah, made a difference there between the Jews and the church. He's upset with the way they've treated Israel. Ad infinitum, and judgment is coming. Okay, now having said that, when you read non-resistance, these verses in 538 through 42, remember Peter, hey, those who live with the sword will die by the sword. You also have to read the other verses in the scriptures. For example, you got to go with Paul as well. Or you can reject Paul and say, Paul tried to Christianize his own little Christianity. All we can go, go by are the Gospels. But then you get a problem because New Testament writers are quoting one another right? back and forth. If we have time, maybe we can get into some of that. But um, what does Paul say? When Nero was in rule, remember? When Nero was ruling, that's when he penned down his letter. God has given us three offices in the land. What are they? Three offices. New Testament teaching, for sure. In the church? Church, family, state. Right? Church, family, state. Family, church, state, whatever. Very simple. You thought it was going to be something profound. <laughs> the Vatican news, right? Sorry, give it yes. So those three offices of the land. Now, you have the state, right? That can, that's supposed to defend the weak, etc., etc., etc. So if you're a Christian and you sign up working for the state, you can bear arms. Now, I bear arms, but I don't work for the state. I almost sleep with mine. <laughs> but uh, that sounded real good. No. But uh, there is justified homicide, unjustified homicide. Now I just jumped into Christian ethics, right? We've gone through that book. We have verses for and against you know, pacifism. Christians should just lay down and just get the beating, right? Is that the biblical view? Why not, Danny? Those who live with the sword die with the sword. Yeah, but I think that there's, um, I, I can't quote the scripture here, but I think there's some word in the Bible where, you know, you have the right to protect yourself. Revelation um, 24? <laughs> Just joking. 23? Corey, you sent me a question. It was a long one on a text. How do you justify this and that at the same time, Nick? What was your solution? Uh, Luke, well, it's not a solid solution, but it's something. It's Luke, a soft one? Luke 22, uh, 38. Yeah. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And that was when he was saying earlier, when I sent you out, did you lack anything? He said, no. And he said, now you take these things, these privileges. Now take them. And then they said, here's a sword, two of them. And he says, that's enough. Mm -hmm. So whatever the swords are for, protection, mm -hmm. wild beasts, uh, raiders, whoever. I mean, that could be. Oh, you cut fish? Cut fish, you know, sword to cut a fish. Right, exactly. You know, so. Well, I only need the, I only need the sword of the spirit. <laughs> Some would say, right? <coughs> Try to say that to the Christians that are being massacred right now in Syria. You know. You know, my wife came up to me before I left, and she says, "Did you hear about this?" Uh, the the, the baby, uh, what was it, four or five year old? You heard about that story? The father just beat the living business out of his own kid. Four or five, you guys have to see that. It's all over Facebook and YouTube and news now. And uh, I said, uh, no, uh, I heard something about it, but I don't follow those stories because I don't need to feed my agnosticism, my little pockets. 2011, is that what you're talking about? I don't know. Oh. But uh, I guess. Well, this is the brain. I mean, hardcore brain. The brain is destroyed. Yeah, I saw that in the news. Yeah, he clocked him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the brain is damaged and everything else. And then I guess the mother took the baby to the hospital, five year old. So it fell down the stairs, and the family's like, <laughs> no. And then uh, the baby died, you know? And uh, seriously, my wife's like, and she wants to share the story, you know, because for some reason, I guess, you know. You know, watching all those murder files and all that stuff, I, 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 I can't hang with it. It's too dark. Uh, 
this world is already dark by just looking outside my window. You know what I mean? So I'm like, please don't share anymore. She's like, why? I said, because I don't want it in my head. And she goes, but it's happening. I says, yeah, but I don't want to go into that place where Nick says, I know, what's God taking a nap? And then she stopped. I don't want to feed, you have the choice there, I don't want to feed that part of me, you know. And I just told her, I says, you know, this is why there's a lot of Jewish atheists. Because their grandparents or parents were killed at Auschwitz. And they're going, mm -hmm. Yahweh, who? Okay, let me get a Heineken in Tel Aviv and grow dreadlocks. The secular Jews, can you blame them? Well, they are without excuse, I understand that. But I just can't feed myself with too much, especially real stories. Give me fiction. I can roll with that, and I don't even like fiction. You know? Unless it's underworld. I'm just joking. So, careful what you put in. And I shared one of those stories when I was teaching out in, uh, in Murrieta. And uh, it was a story that I read in Dostoevsky. Right? Remember the tiger? can only chew and gnaw. Fyodor Dostoevsky, the brothers Karamazov, the Russian novelist, he says uh, human beings are artistically cruel, artistically evil. You know what I mean? Tigers don't think of nailing people by a fence, hanging them up, you know, leaving so till morning, you know, or ripping out a, a baby out of a mother's, mother's arms, you know, like the Turks did to the Circassians, and threw them up and cast them on the bayonet. I'm like, this is a great story to open up my my chapter on the problem of evil. <laughs> and I did. Because now you have to clean it up. But I can't read too much of it. You know what I mean? It's too dark. Even though it's real, there's enough darkness. I mean, Hillary's running, you know? All right, setting a joke aside. All right, so, chapter 7, we see the specific teachings on prayer. And they said what? How's this? They've been spending time with Jesus now. Some time with the Lord. And all of a sudden, hey, Jesus, how do we pray? How do we pray? Our Father, which are in heaven. That's a prayer to stick to, <clears throat> solidly, because you got a lot of it in there, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Giving thanks, giving praise where praise is due, right? Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, right? Deliverances etc. So there's a lot of stuff in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and then you have, of course, entering by the narrow gate. Entering by the narrow gate in chapters 13 through 14. Also unique in Matthew is the clear declaration that Jesus spoke with authority. And that's heavy. You've heard it said, as it is written, but I say unto you, adding some new light or I should, I'm not going to say new light. I don't like that word. Additional light to Old Testament teaching. You know? So like the flashlight, but, you know, with a beam. I'm going to add a little more light to what this passage really means. It doesn't just mean this. It also means that. And when you start doing that, from Leviticus, people are going to raise their eyebrows and go, wait a second. Who is this guy? But then he spoke with such authority, right? Even as a teenager, debating the priests at the temple and whoever else were there, right? Next, in chapter 9, 27 through 34, we see Jesus healing the blind and the mute. Now, when he pulls off a miracle like that, if you define a miracle as a supernatural act of God, then he is God. So, when he gives a message, the messenger delivers a sermon, right? And then he backs it up with a miracle. Now the messenger and the message is solidified. You see what I'm saying? It's one thing running around claiming to be, you know, before Abraham was, I am. But it's like, hey, before Abraham was, I am. Really? Yes. Me and the Father are one. Really? Check this out. Lazarus, come on out. <laughs> People are like, whoa, that was heavy. So he did apologetics. He proved some of his things, right? Sins are forgiven, yeah. I can say that, or I can show you a miracle to back it up, which is easier, you know. He's brilliant. Of course he's brilliant. 
Now in chapter 9, 35 through 38, the phrase, the harvest is ripe, is also unique in Matthew. Harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few, right? Uh, Matthew also mentions the way of a disciple, chapter 10, 16 through 42. Now there's a lot of verses there, the way of a disciple. 16 through 42, it's not a short brief teaching, there's a lot of it there. And the call of a disciple in uh, 11, 25 through 30. So the way of a disciple is longer, then you got the call of the disciple, and then uh, in uh, chapter 11 again, 20 through 24, we see the condemnation of various cities, also unique to Matthew, not condemned by the others. Then in chapter, not to say that they weren't condemned by them in mind, because they knew what Jesus would have said, just saying Mark and Luke and John doesn't condemn these cities. Um, then in chapter 13, we see the parable of the tares, the dragnet, including the hidden treasure, and, in, and the treasure, um, including treasures new and old, and the pearl of great value. Why am I calling it the pearl of great value? Because some translations call it the pearl of great price, and I don't want to compare it with the pearl of great price and get into Mormonism. So the pearl of great value, I stick with that translation, whatever that was. Uh, from chapter 16, uh, 17, through Matthew 28, lots of stuff. There you have Peter, the rock. You have payment uh, of temple taxes, forgiveness, and the parable of the unforgiving servants. You know, those who sin a lot tend to be more forgiving. Amen? You realize that? That's why Corey hasn't sinned a lot, because he's an unforgiving person. You know? if Just joking. If Christian. Yeah, if they're Christian, yes. Be, be, very important, yes. <laughs> not, talking about, not talking about Marilyn Manson. Oh, you're talking about <laughs> Christianity. Exactly. No, if you really like lived a horrible life and you have some serious sins under your belt, right? You know, and uh, then you become a believer and somebody comes in and they have like, you know, this horrible background, right? Some people would just be like, ew, and kind of walk away. But then there's the, the people that maybe they haven't been a prostitute, but... Maybe they were heavily into other sexual sins and drugs. They're sort of like, hey, I'm right. I get it. Let's have a coffee. You know what I mean? Really? You know? I know. I know people like that. I know people who have been out of church slamming heroin. And then they come back, and you hope that they're back. But tell you, those guys, the, the people that they reach, I couldn't reach. You know? Hence, once saved, always saved, Krista? Yes or no? <laughs> I saw that, yeah. She posted on Facebook. What do you guys think about that real quick? <laughs> Short version. Once saved, always saved. Yes? Just a yes or no. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that simple, is it? Just um, percentage-wise. 51 50? I say yes. But? All right. I want to believe in Jesus. You want to? All right. That's fair. So do I. <laughs> I hope that's the truth. I heard something, Nick, I like that says, you can't lose your salvation before you give it away. Yeah. You can reject the gift of salvation. Even after you become a believer? After you become a believer, then you're not you one saved, always saved. You, you can accept Jesus, but if your behavior is not like Jesus, But none of our behaviors like Jesus. No, no, but you progressively are in the Sure. But the, so you can't lose it if you give it up. Exactly. Not lose it. That's a difficult answer. I know, I know. That's what I'm trying to get to, Gracie. Karen? That the Lord knows those who are true here. Yeah. And for us, it's very difficult to count. Yeah. <laughs> Krista, I want to know what you think. Because I saw what some of your friends said. I just skimmed through it yeah. while driving, right? No. <laughs> I'm just getting too long. No. I don't necessarily think that you... I, I think you can turn away and then, like, if you quench the spirit enough, if you don't want, like, only... You know, if you do enough of that, I think that there's a way to lose your salvation because you're not, you're no longer choosing him. That's what I feel, but 
know. Not what you feel, it's what you think. think Never yeah. say that's what I feel. Yeah, I know. That's what I think. You're, yeah, that's what I think. Well, I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. I think what's it's a good way to kind of fall back on what we do know about the old text. The old the old covenant was basically do this, keep this, and then you'll be accepted. The new covenant is brought in. It's just unlimited. Well, not unlimited. Well, just a grace that's just overflowing that brings us to a spot that we can fulfill in this power of the Holy Spirit, God's standard. So, under that new covenant, I believe it's. I would have to say it'd be probably very difficult to lose that gift of salvation. Mm-hmm. But to me, on the same side is. How can somebody constantly reject the Lord after coming to Him, yeah. die in that state, and yet still get into paradise? Yeah. By grace. It's a lot of grace. <laughs> and because then, at that point, you're going to say, "Well, then salvation is work, works based." Because then, if I can be accepted into paradise based on what I did or did not do then it's adding to or subtracting to the work of Christ. I got, I got, a, I got a solution. But can I say something for you? Sure. Okay. We, we, started, uh, we started from the point that, that through Adam's fall, we are in a fallen state. Right? Yeah. Our body and our being is in a fallen state. Mm-hmm. But David, he's saving actually our soul, not our or pieces of human body. Justified. We will be. We'll be justified. We are justified. We're justified. Exactly. Those that he justifies, he glorifies. Our bodies are waiting. I think God will pull the plug if He foreknows you're going to leave it, leave His flock. I think it's one of those. We're going home. Yeah. Just going to kill you. Right? I'm just going to take you home. Seriously, that's what I think. I think that's the Bible said that. Well, yeah. yeah. Leave him for the destruction of Satan. Yeah, that one went through my mind last night. Was, uh, he yeah. kind of gave him over to Satan so that his, uh, his body yeah. would be destroyed, but his soul yeah. would be saved. And return to your own vomit has nothing to do with salvation. Yeah, yeah. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. I have another friend that quoted, quoted another good scripture, though. What? Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. Take care, brethren, that they're, they're not... Um, be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is so called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So, another good one. Yeah. Okay. But am I the one holding fast? Now he's with you, though. How in the world can I grasp onto anything if I'm a corpse? Not a corpse anymore. No. You're born again. You're alive and well. And you, in fact, your corpse is so alive, you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yes. Mm-hmm. But it's not a fear where you're like, oh, my God, I hope I don't go to hell. We can't live our lives like that. If it's like that, you know what? It's just up and down, yin-yang, fear, happiness, fear, happiness. There's no peace and everything else. But, you know, I look at it this way. If salvation is revocable, how could eternal life really be a gift? Is eternal life a gift? Yeah. There you go, Nick. Sorry, Nick. Are you saved again? There you go, Nick. Yeah. It'd be going back and forth so often. Do it. You know what was really more ridiculous? God foreknew all this. Hey, you go. You're saved right now, but you're really not. You're going to blow it next year, Nick. I need that back. What? Back and forth. And then he foreknows on the 99th time, I never get to play it back, you know what I mean? Because I you know, jumped out of an airplane and hit myself on a rock, so it's over. So I was like, well, what a waste of time for an omniscient being. I'm not trying to get all crazy with cool little predestination talk and all this other stuff. Really, those are the analogies that, that, were, that I think help, you know. This back and forth business... 
Here's, here you go again. Now you're back. You're back. And I don't know if I'm in or out. That's a heavy burden. It's horrible. <laughs> and as a finite and as a finite father, talking about us, finite parents, would you do that to yours? Being not perfect, being evil, not morally perfect, not being all good, not knowing all things. If my son went on a shooting spree, that is cool. Not me too young to do that. But say he did so, and he gets locked up. I, I would put money on his books. I would go visit him. He's still, he's still my son. I would like, can you snap out of this? You have a lot of praying to do. Get back to the drawing board. Get the scriptures down. Start preaching in there. Stop wasting time, you know. But be careful there because because when we break when we we break those things, okay, listen, you've heard the whole thing. Uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, is in you, and then you got the epis upon you, and then he's through you, and all of these great prepositions, and you know, th that's all good stuff. We're gonna get into that in the next ten minutes for the last hour. Well, I'm not gonna get into Ain and, and all those things in Greek, but how why in there why they're important. But do you think they knew that? When the, when the Jews were run down, peasants, you know, and soldiers and everything else running down and get baptized by John the Baptist? They had no clue. They had no clue. And then they died before Galatians were written and Romans were written. Were they sealed? Did the Holy Spirit fill them, but it didn't com come upon them so they couldn't speak in different languages? You know what I mean? How important is all that stuff? This is important. Just like the gifts of the Spirit. Did they know about the gifts? I don't think anyone in Naz Nazareth knew about the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of prophecy that we read about in, in Paul. I don't think anybody could. And they were as saved as they could be. They didn't know about, they didn't know about one saved, always saved or not. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and you shall be saved. That's the gospel, plain and simple. It's there. Yeah. I don't know if it's theologically got it right, but I'll just throw it out there. But, um, and that's the difference. Like you brought up the, the, the uh, Mosaic Covenant, right? Mm -hmm. That was an agreement between them and God. Mm -hmm. They both mm -hmm. said yes, and then they couldn't keep it. Right. But the, but the Abraham, Abraham Covenant, had, Abraham had... His faith was kind of for righteousness, but when that covenant was cut, mm -hmm. he didn't do anything. He was asleep, right? It was, right. It was basically a promise. God doing the business. God. God doing the business, walking. And that's the same kind of thing it points back to when it mm -hmm. talks about our faith, right? That's the same kind of thing that God is doing. It's a promise mm -hmm. that your faith activates. Yeah. And there it is. I mean, or I don't want to get into where it's activated, who activates it, all that. Sure. Thing. But I mean, that's, it's a promise that is not dependent on you mm -hmm. to fulfill any kind of merit-based actions. Yeah. Romans 8, 28, though, things seals it up. You alluded to it earlier, right? Order salutis. Order of salvation, right? Very long in the Orthodox tradition, long in Catholic circles, very short in Protestant circles because we're not that old, right? But uh, here's Romans' version, 8, 28. So he says here, and we know, so we know, we know, no, not we think, we feel, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called, called according to his purpose, and you can't get saved unless you're called, right? Unless the Father draws you. So why would, you know, you run around and be a Mickey Mouse Christian unless you were drawn in the first place? We can have our lives going like this. We try to keep it like this, but anything can go sideways. Well, and listen, we're not as razor sharp as Adam and Eve. How much of your brain do you guys use? Different types of There you go. We can have triple PhDs, and we still use less than 5%, right? So the brightest of the brightest, brightest is still right out to lunch a little bit. I think God would kind of look into that a little bit and go, you know what? These guys are so fallen, right? Love me to the best of their capability. Try, you know, and, and, and then you start looking at how many believers really truly love the, the word or know the word. 
And then you go to Jesus, we're split hairs. If you love me, do what I say. But do you love Jesus? Yes. But you're not in the scriptures. You don't know the scriptures. So how can you say you love him when you don't do what he says? Because you don't know what he said. You're clueless. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's also mm -hmm. sort of out there. And then you have, again, the people in Nazareth, Galilee that got saved. They had the Old Testament, right? They didn't have a New Testament yet because it wasn't written yet. The first followers of the way in Antioch, right, up in Syria. How much of the New Testament did they know? Not much. But the more you have, right, the more responsible you are. But looking at this verse here, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are, one, called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew. Divine omniscience is, is a play here. Remember? Here you go. I foreknew you. There you go. No. There you go. No. Want some, Danny? All right. But you're going to die on your way home, so I'm taking it back right now. He's better off pulling the plug on you and take you home yeah. to get you out of this miserable state. And if you have this, if there is this stuff going on, right, passing the plate back and forth, before you blow it again, I'm going to get you out of here. But would you do that with a gift? If you're all good. Make a friend of mine just passed away. Mm. Wow. The she was serving the Jewish lady working in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And then she became part of our prayer team. And the Lord would give her so many revelations, things out of this world. Mm -hmm. Even praying for people in Central America and some other countries, and the Lord would give her mm -hmm. a word of knowledge and stuff to tell the people what to do. And then um, after a while, um, of course, she's not more a legend. She was a straight lady, you know, sure. very nice and pretty. Yeah. And then she, um, her, one of her brothers, uh, also called Christian, they started saying that uh, they started having a different discord of the doctrine. Mm -hmm. And then she became sick again. Mm -hmm. And then she would help the brother. Mm -hmm. And now they want to depart the church. And mm -hmm. they start their own thing. Interesting. So as they were starting something new, uh -huh. but it was not according to what it was correct. Mm -hmm. See that and he want to tell anybody, mm. just isolated herself. And uh, the lady that, that used to be part of the therapy went to see her. Mm. And they, they saw her that she wasn't the same person anymore. Mm. With the same anointing, the same, um, you know. And, and the, the Lord, according to the lady, lady said, we know that the Lord took her mm -hmm. because they didn't want her to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. that idea, you know, it's time to go. It was amazing that she's still young. I'd rather, if, if that's the wrong view, I, I would rather have it that way because that just makes a lot more, well, it makes human sense. More fair. More fair to be, you know. Fair from the, from the ultimate fair just. Yeah. And just judge. But anyway, so we have his omniscience at play. He called us. You can't come to the Father unless he draws you, right, and all these things. Um, so... We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, not your purpose, his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that, in order that, there's the conclusion marker, in order that he might be, sorry, I misread that. Yeah, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined, right? He also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I don't see Nick anywhere in there. Now, we're in there because we're, we're walking and we, we want to be producing fruit and, and, and things like that and pray for each other and pray for ourselves and walk as straight as we possibly can. Sometimes I think we can walk straighter than we do. Yes or no? Maybe you guys have arrived. I haven't. But you know, you're thinking about these things are healthy. I didn't mean to get on a tangent on that, but um, hopefully that added a little bit of sense. Heavy questions though. 
uh, that, that he's doing, he's doing the order salutis. I'm along for the ride. I'm not even a co-pilot. I'm way in the back seat. Uh, not trying to do my best salvifically, but I will do my best as far as works go. Works, but not salvifically speaking. Or maybe both of them are tied together. He knows. I don't. I don't I'm not going to think about it too much. And you certainly don't have to be in this camp or that camp. Mix the two and go, wow. But never take the route and go, wow, this is a mystery, and throw it away. You know what I mean? Put yourself in, in God's shoes, which is very hard to do, right? But at least written down. Omniscient, right? Perfect. His heart weeps for sinners. You've come to the cross now, right? And Jesus is like, hey, I died for that guy. And he's your advocate, advocate in Swedish. Advocate is attorney, right? He's the advocate standing right there. Hey, I know Corey just fell down and busted a tooth, but, you know, I, uh, I died for him. Does, 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 do you really need an advocate? No, because Jesus knows what the Father knows. You have the Trinity at play there. So it's not like Jesus is reminding the Father, don't be so rude. You know what I mean? He's right here. I died for him, remember? And the Lord's like, yeah, that's right, you did, huh? Guys, that was a long time ago, though. It was 2,000 years, so I'm not sure anymore, you know. And Jesus died for you. And there you come crawling in your sinful state, and you finally get to know him. And then you're out because you decide to do something stupid. Look at the prodigal son. And think of yourself as the prodigal son. You know, God is gracious. God is good. So you made me think about all those things when I saw that thing on Facebook, which was good. So... See, Facebook is good sometimes. Let's finish up with this slide and go quickly into hermeneutics because I'm dying to get into those slides. So we have uh, the harvest is ripe, also unique in Matthew. Matthew also mentions the way of a disciple, call of a disciple, leaven. We see the condemnation of various cities, unique to Matthew. Chapter 13, parables of the tares, the dragnet, including the hidden treasure, pearl of great value. Chapter 16 through 28, again, Peter, the rock, payment for temple taxes, forgiveness, parable of the unforgiving servant. We also have the parable of the vineyard workers, used to be one of my favorite. Um, the parable of the two sons, the denunciation of external spirituality. There's a little bit of adding additional light to Old Testament teaching, right? Running around like this, oh... And Craig's like, what's wrong, Nick? Man, I've been fasting all week. Man, you sure are holy. <laughs> you had your reward, Jesus is, running around, groaning and everything else. You better just go have ten falafels, you know what I mean? And don't run around and be a spiritual poser. So he adds stuff here. But you can go really far in the church if you're a spiritual poser. Pardon? You, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, fa in fact, if you are a spiritual poser, you can really work yourself up the ladder in a lot of churches. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. And it's sad. Um, so there are benefits. <laughs> listen, this is not being spiritual. This is, I'm going to show you right now. Like You see somebody in the scene like this, and their eyes are all lit up like they're crazy. You see people like that? They love the Lord, right? But they look at you like they're crazy. And then somebody will say to me, look at that. That's the eyes of the Holy Spirit. I'm like, no. <laughs> that, it, that looks crazy, and I don't like it. I get a weird <laughs> vibe. You know, they're just like... Like they just saw the light, you know what I mean? Just like, like two lit up for the face, and it's just like, wow, that's odd. That's odd, you know? Or just like, you know, just really like overly calm, overly nice, overly fake in everything. It's like, what really makes you tick? Are you passive aggressive or what's going on? Do you know what I mean? Just be real. Be real. Anyway, I'm not saying that's what Jesus, well, Jesus is probably saying be real, but not like I said it. He said here, denunciation of external spirituality. Where on the outside you appear to be so spiritual, right, being seen by people. Jesus condemning the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, how's that for Jesus the loving Sermon on the Mount, right? Riding around lowly on a donkey, dying for you and I. And then he's like, hey, you guys. You guys are like whitewashed tombs. Think of an ossuary box. You're like a whitewashed tomb filled with dead men's bones. That's you guys. We teach the Torah. Wow. 
That's crazy. The same meek Jewish Jesus. Right? And he got upset one time, right? Flipped the tables. Because they had turned his father's house into a den of thieves. So there was just times when Jesus really didn't play. Right? He was serious too. Um, anyway, he's condemning scribes and Pharisees, external spirituality, sets the record straight. Listen, if you lust after a woman in your own heart, right, you've committed adultery. If you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. Chapter 24, the infamous end time passage. Then Matthew moves on to admonition on being ready, readiness. So even though we're still sitting here waiting 2,000 years later and the world is going, you guys still believe that Jesus is going to come back? It's been an awful long time. Yes, we do. And then if you tell them God is timeless, they're like, all right, listen, go have your party. God is timeless, you know, we have to be patient, all this other stuff, you know. Let's just, let's just wait for that last person to get saved. Once that last person gets saved, that's when we're all going home. Just whoever that last person is. Um, but we're supposed to be ready, right? Look up now, your salvation is near. That urgency, that urgency that uh, uh, Christ is mentioning in 24 and 25. Final chapters, we arrive at the parable of the wise and wicked servants, uh, the parable of the ten virgins, uh, and the sheep and the goats. The death of Judas is then mentioned in chapter 27. Uh, the guard at the tomb, 27, verses 62 through 66. And the report of the guard in chapter 28, 11 through 15. And finally, the Great Commission, chapter 28, 16 through 20. Okay, I will end on that right now on Matthew. If you need a break, uh, go take it. And I will open up hermeneutics next. And we will fill in Mark later. I have a bunch of open files here that we're going to get into next. Let's see if this worked. Yeah.